Hello everybody and welcome, my name is Ursa Ryan and this is another Civ 6 guide to help you learn the skills that you need to take on Civ 6 and become a bit of a better player. I've done a bunch of guides over the last year or so, most of which have been with Rome, who I think are a fantastic neutral Civ, and you can check them out in different playlists on my channel. There's a playlist for every type of victory, from cultural to scientific to domination to all the sorts of things, and by and large, with a couple of tweaks that the game has updated over the time, they're all still pretty relevant, so go have a look at the Rome guides if you want a little bit of a tutorial as to some of the, you know, things to learn with Civ. But recently, we had Babylon as part of the Frontier Pass, and these guys are very, very different to, well, just anyone that's come before them. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And I wanted to do another guide where we go through Babylon and we tweak the domination guide. So this is specifically a domination guide. We're going to be taking a domination victory here, but we're going to be tweaking that and basically applying it to Babylon and, well, just essentially teaching you how to use Babylon in a domination victory. We're going to be looking through first turn strats, we're going to be looking through scientific uh, achievements and civics and city-states you want to look out for and techs and strategies and all kinds of bits and pieces. That's kind of, well, hopefully this will be really useful. As ever, if you want to play along with me and actually physically play the game as I go through it so that you can kind of pick up what I'm doing, these are the details, this is the old-fashioned way of doing it, there's the game seed, there's the map seed. We are playing an Emperor difficulty, uh, small continents and islands map with pretty much all of the settings left alone. I'm not using any gameplay changing mods, but if you want to do it exactly, come to the Discord. You will find the exact save file that you can literally copy and paste into your Civ game and play along with me. This guide will be on standard speed. I think our previous guide was on online speed, so standard gives a more complete, a slightly longer game. Well, it's effectively twice the length of game, but realistically you don't need twice as many turns because the game does tend to accelerate towards the end of the game and once you've built up a decent military. But Standard speed, I think, is, is, well, fairly standard. We're going to be playing on Emperor difficulty. This is a guide where I want to teach you the specifics about how to play Civ. I don't want to spend my time trying to cheese the game in order to beat Deity AI, which, as we all know, Deity cheats. It is a big cheat. It is absolutely horrendous. And Emperor gives us a really difficult game that you should aspire to being able to beat fairly comfortably if you've picked up tips and tricks and, and we'll get there. But we don't have to worry about the deity doing its thing at the moment. I do like Emperor difficulty. It's a really, really good middle balance. As you can see, I've got loads of mods in use, but none of those are gameplay changing mods. They're all cosmetic mods. Again, you can come over to Discord if you want to check those out. There are three rules I want you to keep in mind with domination victories. Three things that you should remember that will take you through the entire game. And if you hold these things above all others and you don't worry about anything else, you should be fine, okay? Number one, builders, 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 right? Builders are so important. You need to get as many builders in a game as you can. If you are dominating the world and picking up city after city after city, or maybe you're settling all over the place, or maybe natural disasters have hit you, or you're under attack and people have pillaged your land, builders are the key to any win. You should, at all times in a perfect game, have every single one of your tiles improved that is being worked, and every tile that is being worked should be improved as much as it can with the adjacency of other tiles. So for instance, if my capital was population four, I would want to make sure that I had four improved tiles that it was working. So for instance, if I was working this sugar tile, I want there to be a plantation on it because if there's no plantation on it, I'm missing out on gold per turn. If I'm working this sheep and I don't have a pasture, I'm missing out on production. If I'm working this tile or over here for some food, this marsh, then again, I could have cleared the marsh and then put another farm down in order to give the same food, but also release a bunch, an absolute bunch of food. To my capital. You need to make sure that all of your tiles are improved. It is essential if you want to play the game well and accelerate through the game. Accelerating is a concept where we will not be winning this game until probably about uh, two-thirds of the way through. It's even more extreme when you play on Deity. They 
computer it has a really fast accelerated start on any difficulty setting that you play short of maybe king and below so we want to make sure that we're picking up in the late stages of the game and if you don't improve your tiles it will not happen secondly you need to have the late game in mind the hardest two ages in any Civ game, especially in Deity, but even in Emperor, are the Ancient Eras and the Classical Eras, okay? Those two eras, the AI has a huge advantage over you. War is really difficult because, for instance, all these marshes and hills and forests and everything makes a land attack incredibly difficult to pull off. Your swordsmen have only got two movement, and if they're taking about 18 turns to cross the map and attack somebody, then quite frankly, they're going to have musketmen by the time you, you get there. It's Early game war is really, really tricky. The AI gets a lot of early game bonuses. Always keep the late game in mind. Civ 6 is an incredibly complicated game. The AI, as we all know, struggles. It does a good job. I, I, I berate it a lot, and there are definitely some issues the AI has. I'm not going to defend it from that. But it, generally speaking, does a good job. It doesn't do as good a job at the later stages of the game because if you think about it in terms of like a sort of decision making process, if at the moment on turn one the AI was looking at this, it's only got a certain amount of decisions it's got to make. It can move this settler six different places or it can settle, so that's seven options. It can move the warrior to uh, eight different tiles, so that's sort of seven options there and eight different options there, so it's like seven times eight to give you 56, I think. Um, that, that sort of gives you a sense of how many decisions it's got to make on turn one. A computer can do it like that, you know, it's really not a problem. But at the later stages of the game, when the AI has got 15 techs it can research, 30 cities, a bunch of different things, it's got hundreds of thousands if not millions of decisions to make. It will not be as clever. Your time is in the late stages of the game because your human brain is so much more clever than the AI. You can focus using the later stage as, as your advantage. As long as you are in the game towards the information and future or eras, then you will win the game. It is, it is that simple. As long as you are competitive in those late stages of the game, you will win the game. It also helps that attacking a city with a swordsman is fine, but attacking a swordsman with an infantry is much easier. You know? Turning up and trying to siege some walls down with a catapult is, 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 you know, possible and doable, but turning up with rocket artillery with three range and 95 bombard strength is so much easier. And of course, don't forget bombers towards the late stages of the game. So, you know, holding in to the late stages of the game, as soon as you get through to the information era and actually atomic eras in terms of what tech and what military units you can bring to the game, the late stage is so much easier. You've got to hang in as long as you can to the late stages of the game. And finally, we go on about this so often. So, so, so often. There is the Ursa Ryan military guidance tree of importance that you need to remember, okay? In Civ 6, there are four branches of military. You have an army, you have a navy, you have an air force, and you have nuclear capability. It is in this order. If you have the most nukes in the game, you are likely to win. Okay, nuclear weapons are the number one thing in the game. They are difficult to build, they are difficult to obtain, they're difficult to get production and resources in place in order to develop them properly. But if you do, you can waste entire cities and armies in a single strike. They are impossible to defeat with a decent player who has a decent amount of nuclear devices especially when we get all the way down to thermonuclear devices those things are insane a thermonuclear device for instance has a two tile radius around a city that's three seven 12 16 19 tiles in one hit of absolute death it is impossible to defeat. The second most important is an air force. If you have the highest air force in a game, you will win. An air force can disintegrate a land army, it can disintegrate a navy, and more importantly, bombers can rip apart walls like a small child shoving their gammy fingers into your prized Lego collection. It, they are insane. 110 bombard strength is so much more powerful than a comparable siege weapon of 80 bombard strength, even down here. The poor old rocket artillery with bombard strength 95, it can't compete with bombers. 
You can't compete with 110, especially because jet bombers come along later with 120 and 15 range. Air Force is ridiculous. So, so far we have nuclear devices and then we have Air Force. Next up, Navy. If you have the biggest Navy in the game after that point, then you will win the game. A navy is really important. A navy is so much more versatile than an army. It moves quicker. It has more ranged capacity. If you control the seas, you will win a game. And this is even more important on a water-based map, but it is still important even on Pangeas and things. It's um, amazing how useful a navy can be. If you imagine I have an island here and there's an island over in this direction and I want to move my army from one island to the other and I do not control the sea, it doesn't matter how many tanks and, you know, amazing military units and amazing land units I've got, I can't get them from one island to the other. Controlling the seas is an incredibly effective tactic in Civ. There is a, region, a reason, I should say, why the Spanish, English, French, Portuguese empires did so well in the world for so many hundreds of years. It's because the navy is such an important aspect of just global domination. And finally, a land army. Yes, artillery are good. Yes, tanks are good. Modern armor is fantastic, but an army will not win you the game. It's more important to have an air force and a navy. And yes, an army, okay, you can win a domination victory just by chucking knights at people and muskets and field cannons and cuirassars and every single unique unit you could throw under the sun. I'm not saying that you can't, that's absolutely fine. But an army is the least important of those four things. Remember those rules, okay? Builders, builders, builders. Stay in the game until the late stages of the game. Hang in on those games until you get towards the end of the game because you will be amazed about how quickly you can catch up. And thirdly, it is important. You go nukes, then air force, then navy, then army. I've actually had games where I've dominated and taken 25, 30 cities with a single, if not two tanks. And I've basically just done the rest with an air force and navy. Like you don't actually need a military, really. Just someone to take a city at the end of the game. Now this guide is specific to Babylon. Babylon were brought in in the Frontier Pass and they have turned the game on its head a little bit with their abilities. The main one is this Amuna Anu Inil, which is of course not how you pronounce it. I'm not famed for my pronunciation. I'm very sorry. Teeth. Just put up with me. I, I'm, I'm British and weird. Eurekas provide all of the science for technologies, minus 50% science per turn. Eurekas uh, are, are really important. They, they are really, really important. Uh, the difference between a good player and a fantastic player is somebody that can manage all of these boosts and effectively give themselves 60% of the task on every tech to do it. If you've got 100 science and the AI has 150 science, but you're getting Eurekas and they're not, you will out-tech them. You know, your beakers is not the most important thing. It's making sure that you, you sort of have a look at this and you do your best in terms of just making sure that you can get everything down. Ugh, Babylon, they turn it on the heads because providing all of the science for Eureka is such a big change. It is a massive, massive change. A really, 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 really big change because Eurekas were always important, but now Babylon can shoot up the tech tree and you can basically tech things out of out of turn. We've spoken in, in sort of depth before about some of the strategies that Babylon can employ, certain chains of science that we should aim for. For instance, being able to beeline straight to medieval era into apprenticeship by building three mines and suddenly you can get an industrial zone down. That's easy. That's, that's I mean, look at this start, for instance. I've got one, two, three, four, four hills just already there. So mines are going to be no problem whatsoever to build. That's, that's absolutely simple. Combine that with the fact that each specialty district type, except from a government plaza, when they're constructed for the first time, you receive the lowest production building three and an envoy. So, I mean, that's insane. That's, that's really, really good. It means if you build, for instance, a campus, you'll get a library free in it. If you build an industrial zone, a workshop will pop in it free. Uh, a commercial hub will get a market for free. Harbour, a lighthouse for free. It only is the first district you build of that type, but it doesn't have to be in your capital. So if I have two cities, one on the coast and one not, and one builds a commercial hub and one builds a harbour, they will both get the first building free. That means that we're going to be pretty heavily recruiting the great people on this tree. We should be able to do that pretty easily. Um, 
I mean, if you think about it, we get a campus and then a library gets popped down immediately. Certainly that's two scientific points per turn, which is pretty cool. It also means though, that we can focus on getting Eureka's pretty nicely. For instance, earn a great scientist to get education. That's a pretty decent one. That's awesome. We are going to be employing a Pingala start with Babylon, specifically this decision down here, which is Grant, plus 100% great people points generated per turn in the city. That, combined with Babylon's three buildings, means that we can get a lot of great people very quickly. We can even get um, uh, ourselves another Pantheon, for instance, in order to improve the number of scientific points we get, which, which really helps. Um, but we want to be getting as many great people as we can. Specifically, I want to be getting as many great scientists as I can, because this triggers the Eureka moment for three random technologies from the classical or medieval era. Well, three random technologies is three free technologies for Babylon, because any Eureka gives me the tech. So I need as many of these great people as possible. At the beginning of the game as well, I also want to be beelining towards recorded history because I would like to build the Great Library. It's not essential that I build the Great Library. If I miss it, it doesn't matter, but it is important that I take over whatever city the Great Library is in as quickly as possible. So receive a random tech boost after another player recruits a great scientist. That means if I miss out on a great scientist, I still get an extra point. Uh, an extra tech, I should say. So that, that makes a big difference. Other things to keep in mind as well is we've got inspiration down in mysticism. Combine that to get more great scientist points per turn. We should be getting every single great scientist in the, in the game effectively. It would take too long to sit down now and talk to you about all the different permutations of amazing Babylon rushes that you can do. There are quite a few involving, for instance, going down the navel melee tree and picking up caravels super quickly. That's a really easy one to do. Rushing through apprenticeship and then through into industrialization. Again, a very easy technology sort of pickup to do. Even getting cavalry at a very early stage by picking up knights. Again, it's difficult because this one feudalism is not something that you can just immediately rush, but it's, it's possible. And, and actually crossbows are a really good one as well. Owning three archers is an incredibly easy thing to do. So there's, there's lots of different things we can do to rush this through, but we're not gonna be focusing on that too much. All I will say is you as a science player are only getting half of the science per turn. You want to be researching something that you can't boost. If there's something that you're looking at, for instance, and uh, let's say, Celestial Navigation, improve two sea resources, and you have literally no sea resources and you are unlikely to ever get any sea resources, that's the tech you should be researching. There's no point researching writing if you think you're gonna meet another civilization. Hint, you are. So these three techs, pottery, animal husbandry, and mining are the first ones you need to focus on getting because they do not have Eurekas. After that point, yeah, researching something that you are unlikely to boost yourself. I should also point out in this particular game, I am not going to go for my own religion. Going for a religion is something I love to do and I really think it's a, it's a strong technique, but this is gonna be a domination focused game where you can use any sieve in it. I'm not gonna focus on religion this time out. In any domination game, industrial zones are the most important districts for you to build. Production is king in Civ 6. The more production you have, the more armor you can build, the more wonders you can build, the more infrastructure you can build. It's really important to get decent industrial zones. If you get your city placement right, um, you can pretty much guarantee yourself at least plus five uh, industrial zones in various places, either through mines or through a double aqueduct four tile separation between two cities, uh, or, or maybe a dam aqueduct combo. There's all kinds of strategic sort of places you can you can sort of do here. Um, the good thing about actually tundra rivers is that they don't tend to flood very often, which is pretty good. For Babylon, however, campuses are equally important because I need scientist points per turn because I need to be getting all of the great scientists in the game. 
the actual placement of the campus is less important. You know, getting those plus three campuses is still a really important thing to do, but for Babylon, I'm only getting 50% of the science. So that's not what we're going for. It's the scientist points per turn, which are the really important things. You can't neglect campuses as Babylon because you need those great scientists. They are essential to get, so I'm still going to be working them. And we've said before in Civ that one of the most important things that you should do as a player is to have a look at these policies, such as the ones in Enlightenment, your what I call 50-50 policies. Rationalism, for instance, extra science from building and campuses. 50% of the city's population 10 or higher. 50% of the district has at least plus three adjacency bonus. If you're doing things right, your campuses should all be in cities with 10 pop, and we should all have plus three adjacency bonuses. That means rationalism will effectively double your science per term. For Babylon, not such a big deal, but it's still important to not neglect science, especially with Babylon towards the end stages of the game. There's a lot of sort of techs that are very difficult to kill, like killing an enemy fighter, for instance, the guidance systems is incredibly tough because the AI so rarely actually properly uses fighters. Actually waiting for them to build one and then killing it is incredibly difficult. But needless to say, an industrial zone and a campus should be built pretty much in every city you've got. You also will be conquering a lot of them. The AI likes to build campuses and it likes to build industrial zones. So keep an eye out for those. Now I personally say that aqueducts are equally important as industrial zones and I would like to see every city in my empire with an aqueduct where possible. Not only because they link really well with industrial zones, with a nice triangle with your city centre, it means that all industrial zones will have a plus three adjacency bonus, which is a really big deal. But they're also quite cheap to build and the extra housing means that I'm pushing up towards that 10 pop limit. I need to get to 10 pop of course, in order to make sure that all of my cities are generating as much resource as possible. Harbours and commercial hubs, I kind of put in the same bracket. It depends on your playstyle. it depends on the map. If you've got a very navally based map, harbours are going to be really important. If you're on a very landlocked map, commercial hubs are equally as important. And some would argue that great merchants generally are better than great admirals, although that's a point for argument. I personally like both of them. But you should aim to get one of these in most of your cities. Don't worry about it too much. You'll pick them up from the AI as you take over their cities. But trade routes equal gold. And gold equals army upgrades and being able to buy out stuff randomly around the map. The amount of domination playthroughs I have played where gold has been a limiting factor is insane. And yes, you can pillage gold from people as you move your army units around them. But it's really, really important that you pick up your own gold your own trade routes. Even if later in the game you send internal routes between your own cities, being able to put food production into your capital for instance in order to get that tank army built or the bombers towards the end of the game, still you're just missing out on free resource if you don't have them. Encampments are very situational. I personally think if your city is going to be building a lot of army, it's worth it. I think it's even more worth it at the late stages of the game once you've got a military academy in place, because then you can build cores and armies directly. That saves you a lot of production and makes encampments worth it. And also some maps with a lot of military city-states on them, for instance, it is worth having encampments over other things, but they're not essential. The one thing that encampments are really good at is distracting the AI. If they are launching a land assault on you and you stick an encampment up with ancient walls, they can't help but move all of their units into the encampment rather than your city. It's a bug with the AI. They're really bad at melee attacking encampments badly. It will protect you. It will protect you a lot. A lot of the other stuff is very situational, however. Theatre squares, for instance, you'll pick them up. It's worth having a couple because if nobody's building great writers, you may as well pick them up yourself. There's a lot of very cheap great writers in the game, especially with Babylon. Being able to build one of these and then being able to put an amphitheatre in it for free, hey, you may as well. It gives you some more culture and it's important to have some culture because otherwise you won't get to nationalism, which is really important because you need cores in your military and you do want to push along the culture tree as best you can because there are some amazing war wielding policies later stages of the game. Entertainment complexes and water parks are to be avoided. They are wasted districts until you get much later in the game and you pick up nat uh, natural history. At this stage, you can build zoos and aquariums. That's when it's worth building because you can build 
uh, buildings that spread amenities across multiple cities rather than trying to effectively just sort of I think well if you built a um, an entertainment complex for instance that gives you one amenity and then the arena gives you another one amenity that's two amenities in a city quite frankly it would be better just to buy a resource from an ai and do it that way as mentioned we're going to be ignoring holy sites although invariably we will end up picking them up from the ai and we're not going to bother with spaceports either spaceports scientific victories they are a lot of production i think our production would be better served on the manhattan project for instance or building bombers Speaking of, the late stages of the game, pick two or three decent cities, you don't need many of these, but decent production cities, build an aerodrome, get those bombers up and running. Very important. I think we should jump into the game though. There's such a thing as too much talking, and we're going to kind of feel our way through this game and explain what we're doing as we're playing it. I want to tech, obviously, as fast as I can, and I want to get over to the uh, decent navy and a decent air force as soon as we can as well. This is a continents and islands map, so at some stage I am going to need a navy to cross the world, but clearly my capital is not the city to be producing a navy, so harbour districts this is not worrying about. We're, we're thinking about first sort of turn tiles here, and quite honestly this is a terrible start, um, but we're sticking with it because I honestly believe that sticking with terrible starts is the best way in order for you to actually learn the game. You can see there is an amazing five food tile up there and we've got a couple of four yield tiles on that sheep hills and then the T over here, although that is a science thing. And there is technically some gold in these tiles here, but really four yield tiles are what we normally go for and we are lacking those in spades. So yeah, I think settling in place is going to be fine. I could move down onto the tundra, but I'm effectively moving away from this sugar tile, which is what I need to work as soon as possible. You can see here I've got the potential for a campus, which would be decent. There's a plus two campus up there, but I can probably put districts down pretty easily in this area. I'm just thinking about other things I can do. There's no other real campus location that I can see. Um, I'm just going to move my warrior to here and to here so you can actually see there is another river over in this location i could go and chase that plains hills tile but i think it's probably worth settling in place for now there's babylon as i say getting this tile is going to be really really important now which tile to work first you can see the babylon getting one of my sabum kitabums is really important because this is effectively a better scout a scout gives me three movement this thing has three movement and sight and is a lot stronger so it's quite it's quite a good unique unit otherwise scouts are a good thing to go for i could build two of those or i can focus on getting food into my capital and getting to two pop as quickly as i can if i get to two pop as quickly as i can i can build a settler as quickly as i can and getting that second city up and running is really important you can see here though there's it's just extremes so i'm going to just work that tile and then switch over to the production when i can for me, mining is the most important because I've got a lot of, of these tiles that could be worked. Remember, I want to build as quickly as I can to getting a builder, and I want to put three mines down as soon as I can in order to get apprenticeship, because then I can build an industrial zone as quickly as I can. I also want to meet somebody as quick as I can in order to get campus districts. Um, so, adventuring across the map with these units, these sabums, is, is a really important thing. You can see there is the coast and another four yield tile over here. So this is going to be a, a lovely place to settle. It's actually not as much space in that direction as I thought. That's not too bad. Right, we're working that food tile. I'm just going to unwork it and I'm going to just force these two tiles to be worked. Babylon will stop growing, probably, but it means that I will pump this tile out nice and quick. And until I can get this food tile in, in which I'll swap to that food tile, Getting these units out is the important thing. There you go. There is our unique unit. It has a lot of sight. I'm going to be sending it up in this direction. We're going to go and see if we can find some workable land. Um, my warrior is going to head back in the other direction just to stop barbarians from appearing in this area. Here we go. There is um, a lovely food tile that we can work. I'm just going to unlock these and let it do what it wants. It wants to work that food tile. I don't want that to happen. I want to work at least one of these production tiles. 16 turns for a settler. This feels and is utterly painful, but you need to get that second city out as quick as you can. And go, Samarakand. This city state, 
traders can now make trading dome improvements plus two gold plus one gold for every adjacent luxury resource actually that can be quite good our outgoing international trade routes grant plus one gold per trading dome at the origin cannot be built next to it so actually with these units i can make trade routes that get a lot of gold it's very very important to keep an eye on city states quests because you want to make as many suzerain friends as you can and sending a trade route is like the ultimate easy one to do because building a trade route i should be able to do pretty quickly you can see these units have three movement a lot of sight but so far no tribal huts i've got a lot of mountain range over here so there's going to be a couple of pretty decent campus spots that i can place but really, oh, there's a lot of land over there, but really nothing too bad. Just looking for where the scout has gone. There's a barbarian heading down here, which is going to be an absolute pain. Right, God King. God King is always the one you should go for first. It's really important you do that because you need a pantheon. And discipline is always better than survey. Never go survey. It's better that you fight barbarians well with the units you've got. There's the barbarian encampment. Okay, that's fine. Finally found a tribal hut. That's better. Right, our first civic. Which direction do we go for? Well, the recorded history is what I'm kind of aiming to go towards quickly, but I am also heading towards the Oracle. For Babylon, it's actually really good if we can get the Oracle quickly, because that plus two great person points in my capital with Pingala is a really, really useful pickup. So I would like to see if I can get foreign trade, discover a second continent nice and quick, and then we'll go from there. Okay, there's a travel hut over in that direction. Um, plus 10 combat strength versus anti-cavalry units. Ugh, that's fine. Oh, a relic. A relic is a fantastic pickup. That gives me four thief per turn, which means I'm guaranteed a pretty decent pantheon. That's nice. Once we've picked up mining, the next one to go for is animal husbandry. Horses, very important that we find those. Tribal hut. And I've met Scythia. Okay, pretty aggressive Scythia, but that means we now have writing. Writing is important and we want to pick, uh, put down a campus as soon as we can. So as soon as this settler is ready to go, that's going to be good for us. This warrior is being harassed by this barbarian encampment. He hasn't quite picked up his promotion yet, which is a bit of a nightmare. So I'm just going to run back and heal him a little bit. Um, you can see my unit here is also being harassed by barbarians. Better that we continue to explore, see if we can find everybody that we can. Uh, I should have sent a delegation. Uh, first turn that was a mistake um, the computer leaves you like a turn of space in order to make friends with them but for now that's okay so with Babylon there's a few pantheons that will work well for you uh, divine spark is fantastic because that plus one great scientist point from a library makes a huge difference a really huge difference of getting those early game scientists together um, getting a builder in the capital is really good as well because it means you can put those three mines down if religious settlements is open though, always worth going for that. A free city in the early stages of the game will give you more in terms of sort of steamrolling and, and snowballing ability than anything else. So we're just going to send that guy out and get that done pretty quickly. Oh, a meteor site. Oh, that's exciting. Keep an eye out for those. Occasionally meteors will land on the ground, but if you go into one, you pick up a free heavy cavalry unit. That, for instance, is a heavy chariot for us, which makes a huge difference against this pesky slinger which has been chasing us this entire time. I mean, yeah, the slinger's even running towards us. Don't do that. So I'm going to actually settle on the coast, not just because I've got a nice full food tile here and the uh, proximity to a lot of production over on the sort of second ring of, of yields, but don't forget, sailing. Found a city on the coast. If I do that, then I get three techs. Scythia have currently got three techs. I've got two. I'm in last place. But by doing this and just settling in place, very uh, sailing immediately. And now I'm on three techs. I am now a joint tech leader. Isn't that lovely, eh? The city is going to immediately try and get itself a builder. Uh, I'm just having a look to see uh, costs of stuff. I can get a builder over in my capital as well which would be pretty decent. I'm just thinking of, of where it's going to be best to pop the builders down. I could put a farm down here, which would get irrigation done quickly. Um, but my capital is the one that I need the production in. So I'm going to use my gold to get a builder going. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my builder to put one mine down, two mines down, and then a farm down. That will give me the Eureka boost for irrigation. And it will also give me the Eureka boost for apprenticeship so we should be able to get campuses down and industrial zones down pretty quickly into my empire this heavy chariot has been 
just delightful. Um, I'm just using it to stop barbarians from getting too far into my land whilst my warrior heals. You can see over in this direction my scout is just sort of stood. He's... I don't really need to keep this guy alive particularly. He's just exploring. I'm thinking settling over towards this direction, over towards Scythia, but also look at all these lovely wheat tiles. Um, don't forget Babylon have an amazing unique building called the Palgum, which gives plus one food to all freshwater tiles. Over here is an amazing assortment of freshwater tiles. So I think actually my settler, let's get you on a little pilgrimage over in that direction. Now, um, nobody's getting scientist points yet, but we do need to build the campus relatively soon if we can help it. I do however need to build just a couple of units. I'm just going to get one slinger going and then we'll build the campus. The slinger, of course, I need to get a kill with in order to get an archer. And lastly, let's go pottery. Okay, I've got a slinger and I've got a warrior. This is all lovely. The slinger actually needs to stay put. I'm just thinking the warrior can't actually move out and attack. So you're going to have to go to there and then I'll get this slinger to attack you. That gets me archery and bronze working because we've got three um, three kills on barbarians now. So actually being rushed with barbarians at the beginning of the game actually can be a very good option for you. <laughs> Just sort of let it happen really. I'm aware that there's a plus three over here. Uh, that would involve plunking it down on top of a sheep. I might just do that actually. That's not a bad idea. All right, switching over to urban planning. Um, discipline I'm going to retain for now. You can see I've got my units positioned so that they are stood on my improvements just so that the barbarians can't uh, ransack those. Um, and I could get an archer, that would be useful, but for now my slinger is doing a, a decent job I'm attacking the ranged unit because they can do more damage to my city if left unchecked. Look, I've got my settler heading over to this distance. The distance from my original city is not a problem. We can fill that in quickly. Now, foreign trade has got uh, mysticism is already boosted. Found a pantheon, I shall. One attack and then get you to kill there. Okay, Babylon is being freed of this barbarian onslaught pretty, pretty quickly. Do have some more barbarians over here, but that's fine. That's for that city to deal with. And here we go. Farm gives us irrigation. That means we can now build a palgum, which is a lovely thing. And then craftsmanship has already been boosted, which is great. Now, this is the watermill improvement. If I build a watermill, I'll get engineering. And that means, uh, no, sorry, I get construction. Construction means lumber mills and lumber mills means a lot of production. So again, we get one kill or one attack and then I get my new unique unit to do that. Okay, great. We are finally cooking with gas. I'm just going to buy that tile. Let's get a plus three campus. That means I'll get a lot of era score by doing that. Um, Tamaris has got horses apparently that I need. I think I do need those horses, but you know, we'll let her think I do. And here we go. Settler, plunk, down. Wonderful. This is a lovely new city and I'm going to treat it immediately to a nice builder. Okay, there we go. Pottery is done. You can see I'm already on eight techs versus Scythia's six, even though I've got three science to her ten. So Babylon is doing well. Like you can see this heavy chariot is having a good old time just stopping barbarians from getting in. Managed to trap this one. Just just upgrade my unique unit. Lovely. Um, otherwise, I think hunting barbarians now has got to be a decent job. We've got one encampment down in the south, we've got one in the north and one in the east. We are surrounded, but not not too bad. Getting rid of that scout has got to be an important thing though. That's he, not, not very friendly. So looking at the text that I could do, for instance, if I just have a look uh, at the available text, find a natural wonder is actually fairly unlikely given my start until I get off the island. Make a trade route, I'll do easily. I just need to build a trader. Um, pasture, I actually do. I mean, I just built over the one sheep I've got in that direction, but I think I did have other, I mean, there are sheep um, and horses around. So, I mean, there's one over there as well. So I can't, I, mean, I should be able to do that pretty easily. There's iron over here to build an iron mine, which I'll do within three turns. So I don't need to do that. Build a quarry. Um, silver is a mine, so that is not going to be the thing, but quarries and stone. Uh, there is some stone that's a little bit away from my land. There is some more stone that is a bit closer, so I could do that. Own two galleys. Uh, I'm unlikely to build two galleys soon, but I could do, and then minor resources much more likely. So of all of these things, astrology, 
Find a natural wonder is the least likely. Ooh, I have a thing. Um, I think Scythia are actually killing that city-state. That is not what I wanted because I wanted to be friends with the city-state, but it's not a bad thing in the sense that if I do go to war with Scythia, which I'm likely to do, I can liberate it uh, and give myself an instant suzerain with it. So that's not, that's not the worst, actually. Okay, yeah, the barbarians are in force again in the south, so we just need to not expand super crazy because that's not going to work very well for us. Okay, we are splitting our resources a little bit now. You can see somebody has got one, like two scientist points coming in, well, one for each of them. But I need to get this great scientist. That is a really important thing for me. So I think building this campus has got to be up there in priority. But I think in this city, I just get the Palgam in because that will improve my production. And yeah, actually this city will be a lot better for that. So I'm going to do that quickly. I've got the campus in on this city. That should be great. And there's plus four, uh, three Iriscore. I have a campus going. Mysticism, I can't stick inspiration down just yet, but now I have unlocked the Oracle. The Oracle is amazing, amazing wonder. At any rate, here is a mine. That means that I am first to the medieval era, because not only have I got the wheel and iron working, but also apprenticeship. It's three techs in one mine. Apprenticeship means that I can build an industrial zone. And finally, a very special shout out goes to Scott Stratton, Major King Kong, and Matthew Wilkinson for all of your support on Patreon, as well as everybody else who likes the video, comments, joins Discord, and generally makes this community really good fun. Thank you very much, guys. You keep me going.